Now let's get into the word. I'm ready to talk about Jesus today. I know that Jesus is the answer. Many times I've stood up here, as I've told you, and I've preached a message that was motivational, but it wasn't, it wasn't gospel. I'll have to stand in account for that. Every word that I give, I'll have to stand in account for it. I'll give an account for every word that I speak. I don't take that lightly. So this morning and every morning in the, as long as I'm on this earth, I'm going to do my best to make sure that as I'm like an artist, I'm painting a picture today. And the picture I'm painting is Jesus. And I don't want you to look at the artist. I want you to look at the painting. I want you to see Jesus today. You've come together, and I love you, and I'm so glad you're here, and we're here, but it'd be such a waste of time if I didn't present to you the gospel and we didn't lift up the name of Jesus. The Bible says where he's lifted up, he'll draw all men nigh. You're, you are an example of that. God has brought us all together. Today I want to talk about religion versus relationship, and it's not the same. Religion versus relationship. I want to look at two pretty strong verses right out of the gate, and then I want to look at John chapter 4. The first verse I want to look at is found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. And Now you get mad at God, don't get mad at me. No one can serve two masters. Are you there? Are you reading? No one can serve two masters. It's either or. You'll hate one or, and love the other. You'll be devoted to one or you'll despise the other. You know what that tells me? You can't like Jesus. See, religion says I like Jesus. But the Bible tells us you either love God or you hate God. That's pretty strong, ain't it? You love God or you hate God. You can't like him. Liking, liking him is lukewarm. I guess that's what I guess that's what it means in, in, in the book of Revelation, where he says lukewarm will be spit out of his mouth. He cannot stand. Oh, here I go. There's no such thing as a casual Christian. There's no such thing as a radical Christian. You're either Christian or you ain't. There's no way you can serve God and not be a radical Christian. You can't be someone who just is a good Christian or a good person. You either like him or you love him. Or love him or you hate him. You cannot like him. You either be devoted to God or you won't be devoted to God. You can't serve God and this translation says money. Some other translations say mammon. You simply means this. You can't serve God and the world at the same time. You can't be in love with God and be in love with what the world offers you. You can't be in love with the goodness and the miracle, and the miracle power of God and the grace of God and love the systems of this world. You can't. You think this, you think, you think our our world today is polarized? That you're this, this, or you're that? Well, I can tell you something that's even more polarized than Republican and Democrat. It's lost or found. It's child of God or fatherless. It's blind or see. It's darkness or light. There is no in between. And if you find yourself in between, you're going to find yourself lost. Here's another one, Matthew chapter 7. Oh, look at this. Enter through the narrow gate. For there is another gate, you see. It's a wide gate. The road is broad, and it leads to destruction. Oh, here's a sobering thought. And there are many who go through this wide gate. Next verse. How narrow 
is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life. And few find it. See, when I ask you, God had been good to you, and you, no. You need to read this. If you found yourself on the narrow road, it was a difficult path. You couldn't get there on your own. You couldn't get there by yourself. You didn't even know the road to veer off. That was the only way you could get to on this road is by the grace of God. Is by God opening your eyes, waking you up, and you didn't even know you were asleep. See, the Bible says you're dead. You were dead in your trespasses and sin. You wasn't just a bad person. You wasn't just, you know, uh, a good person and, and just needed to get a little bit better. No, the Bible says that you were born into sin and you were dead in your trespasses and sin. You were dead. There's nothing worse than being dead. A dead man can't do any. I'm, a dead man can't do anything for himself. Nothing. But Jesus came and you didn't even know you needed Jesus. But Jesus came and snatched you off the, the broad road, the wide road, and said, come this way. What way? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And if any man's going to get this way, come this way, he's going to have to come through me. I don't know about you, but I'm through. <laughs> I am through trying to just make you happy. Oh, God. And make you feel like we had good church. Way past that. Been past that. Don't want to go back. If I if I do, if I don't, if you don't see Jesus today, then I didn't do my job. If you don't leave here thinking about the sacrifice, the blood of Jesus, the cross that he died on, the tomb that he was raised out of, then I didn't do my job. It wasn't church. I don't know what it was, but it wasn't church. I don't know what I said, but it wasn't the gospel. Because, see, people are dying and going to hell. Good people are dying and going to hell. People who like Jesus are dying and going to hell. People who like him. Am I making sense? You can't like him today. You either love him. If you don't love him, you hate him. There's no in between. I see this beautiful story laid out in John chapter 4. It's about a woman at the well. Jesus is tired. You can put the scripture up there. Garrett, I'm gonna blow, I'm gonna blow through it. I'm not gonna read it line for line. When Jesus learned the Pharisees. He'd heard that the Pharisees were saying that Jesus, that he was baptizing people more than they were, and Jesus wasn't even baptizing people. But he had heard that. He knew there was going to be a commotion, so he left. And he left Judea, and he went back to Galilee. But the Bible says in verse 4, he had to travel through a place called Samaria. Now, if you don't... Many of us are going to read that and go on past it. But let me, under, let me help you understand. Jesus said, we're going to have to go to Galilee. We need to go to Galilee, but we're going to go through Samaria. I feel like I have to go through Samaria. And the disciples would have said, no, don't go through Samaria. You shouldn't go through Samaria. Why? Because the Jews didn't have anything to do with the Samaritans. They didn't intermingle. They didn't talk. They didn't have any dealings. The Jews looked down on the Samaritans. And everybody, every good Jew would go around Samaria to get to Galilee, but Jesus said, I got to go. Oh, whew. I don't know about you, but I'm glad Jesus said, I don't care if how many people dodge them. I don't care what people think about them. I don't care what people say about them. I got to go to 
to Samaria. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm so thankful he had to go. This, this means he was compelled. Put it up there, Garrett. He was compelled to travel through Samaria. This was the same compelling that Jesus had after he got baptized by John the Baptist. And Jesus said, I got to go through the wilderness. I got to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. This was the same compelling that Jesus had when he went to the cross, when, when he was in the garden and he sweated drops of blood. And he said, uh, he said, Father, if there's any way I can do this, if there's any way this cup can pass from me, if I don't have to be crucified, if I don't have to go to the cross, if there's any other way I can do this, I'll do it. But nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. He was compelled to go to the cross. He was compelled to, uh, to, to, to face the torture and the suffering nailed to a whipping post, nailed to a cross suspended between heaven and earth. He was compelled to do it. What was he compelled by? Love. He was compelled by love. He had to travel through Samaria. Why? Why did he have to go through Samaria? Because there was some, some unnamed woman that nobody cared about. Don't you love the gospel? Some, some unnamed, unknown woman was going to be at this well in Samaria. And Jesus said, I got to go by there. The disciples didn't understand it. He knew they wouldn't understand it. So he sent them to the grocery store. He said, y'all go on. Get out of my hair. You ain't going to understand what I'm about to do. You go, and I'll go to Samaria. And that's what he done. And the Bible says he got up and leaned up against the well. He was tired. He was worn out from his journey. And he sat down at the well. Oh, I think this is beautiful. Because here you've got Jesus the whale, sitting, leaning up on a whale. You got Jesus fixing to, 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 uh, to use this whale as an illustration explaining that he is the whale and that he is the water. And here he is sitting on this whale and here comes this woman. The Bible says at noon, which is a strange time to go get whale, water from a whale. In fact, it was custom of that day for people who were going to get water to either get it early in the morning or late in the evening. Nobody went and got water at noon except this woman. Why? We're told in the Bible that this woman has some issues. Before you get to thinking something, you got issues too. Let me just, see I'm just going to just do this thing my way. You got issues too. Everybody in here's got some major issues. The woman had a, another woman had an issue of blood. See, that's why we need Jesus. See, every one of us, no matter where you come from, what you've done, how long you've done it, all of us are bonded by the same need for Jesus. We can't get to God by ourselves. We can't earn anything from God by our, We have to have Jesus. Jesus is sitting up at this, on this well, and here comes this woman. And she is walking, and she's carrying her bucket. And she looks exhausted, and she looks tired, and she looks broke down, and she looks weary. And Jesus, help me, Garrett. And Jesus, woman, come to Samaria, and Jesus said, Give me a drink. She looked around and said, what? What time is it? 12 o'clock. Ain't nobody supposed to be here. Jesus said, give me something to drink. She said, I don't give. Why are you talking to me? Follow me, Garrett. Why are you talking to me? You're a Jew. And I'm a Samaritan. Are you with me, Garrett? Yeah. She said, you know, Jews 
don't associate with people like me and I don't associate with people like you. Jesus said, if you knew who was standing here, you want to argue and want to figure it out, but if you knew who was standing here, the gift of God that was standing here in front of you, you would ask me for water. You would ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water. Now, I want to go back, and I want to show you something here. The Bible says that it was about noon. She, she had something she dealt with every day. She was looked down on. Why, we'll read here in just a minute. She had an issue. She, her issue was... Marital in nature. The Bible says that she'd been married five times and the man that she was living with, with was not her husband. And this, there was a terrible stigma that went with this. But you know, I begin to think about this woman. We create our own narrative about her and we want to think maybe she was promiscuous. Maybe she was... It was all her fault. We create narratives about people when we don't even know what's going on in their lives. But these people were looking down on her. That's the reason why she would go at noon so that when nobody would be there, and she was trying to seclude herself and hide herself. And I'd go get water at noon and I won't have to see the looks of the people. And I won't have to hear the whispers of the people. And I won't have to hear the gossip of the people. And she was trying to hide and she was trying to seclude herself. And in her trying to seclude herself, she didn't know Jesus was searching for her. Luke chapter 19, 10 says this. The only reason Jesus came was to find you and to free you. Jesus comes to seek and save that which was lost. Jesus comes to find you and he comes to free you. And that day when she thought nobody was going to be there because every day there was nobody there and she loved it like that because she didn't have to deal with anybody. But when she went to dip some water out of the well on this day, today is the day of salvation. I don't care how many days you've had. Can I tell you today God wants to do something in your life? It looked like every other normal day, but something was different about today because Jesus was there. And Jesus said, if you knew the gift of God who was saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask me and I would give you living water. She didn't understand it, you see, because she was thinking fleshly. And she said, okay, I guess I'll take some of this water. But sir, you don't have a bucket. See, Jesus didn't need a bucket. We're the ones who need a bucket. See, the bucket is faith. The way you receive water, the way you receive Jesus Christ, the fountain that never runs dry is by the bucket of faith. And you say, well, I don't even know if I have a bucket. God has given every man a measure of faith to carry Jesus on the inside of him. She said, you don't have a bucket. She didn't get it. She said, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. She had no clue. <laughs> oh, this, deep, this well is deep. This, I, hallelujah. This well is deep, I said. They, we've been drawing from this well for over 2,000 years. And people, it still has enough water to save every person that's ever been born. You'll never get to the bottom of this well. You'll never run this well dry. She didn't even know what she was talking about, but she was right. The well is deep. So where do you get this living water, she said. Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well to drink from. Jesus said everyone who drinks from this water, from that relationship, from that job, from that vice, that addictive behavior, they'll thirst again. You can't have enough sex not to want sex. 
You can't have another relationship when all you are, when you're void and you just won't, you just got to have somebody to pay you attention. You can't cheat people enough. You always feel like you need more. You always feel a victim. You all, it'll always, the world will always leave you wanting more. But Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you will never thirst again. Anybody listening to me this morning? You'll never thirst again. It's forever. It's an everlasting well with a water that'll quench your thirst and you'll never have to go to any other well before. Why? Because he'll put the well on the inside of you. And this well is a wellspring of living water, never running dry. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. And now watch this lady and listen to her heart. She said, sir, I want you to listen really good. She said, sir, give me this water. She didn't understand it still. She said, give me this water so I won't get thirsty, so I don't have to come here and draw water. See, this lady was trying to do her best to hide because when she walked out, on, out in town, everybody threw their nose up in the air at her, looked down on her. So she can't, she can't keep a husband. She's a slut. She's a home wrecker. She said, if you could give me some water that I wouldn't have to get out of my house, I, no, but I wouldn't have to face the looks and I wouldn't have to face the crowd and I wouldn't have to face the shame and I wouldn't have to face the guilt. God knows it's eating me up on the inside. I wouldn't have to go. She didn't understand it. But the very thing she was looking, trying to find a cure for, Jesus was wanting to give her. See, what Jesus was about to do in her life wouldn't keep her from having to go out in the natural and get water from a well again, but it'd keep her from having to go at noon. <laughs> it, it, she wouldn't be trying to seclude herself and hide out anymore. No, when you know who you are in Christ Jesus and you know your life. Hold on just a second. Let me tell you something. When God saves you, he doesn't erase everything that you've done. You've done it. But you're not that person anymore. That's who you used to be. That's what you used to do. Hallelujah. But I'm not that person anymore. That's not who I am. Not who I am. See, Jesus was about to do something in her that was a spiritual thing. She wouldn't have to wait till noon. No, no. She'd wake up in the morning, brush her hair, brush her teeth, put on her deodorant, put her high heels on, put her Sunday best on, grab her bucket, throw it over her shoulder, huh? swing open her door, get up with all them other women, go into the well, not caring what anybody thinks about her. That's what God will do. I said, that's what God will do. I said, that's what God will do. Hey, hallelujah. That's what God will do. No more condemnation. No more guilt. No more shame. She'd walk out there at 8 o'clock in the morning. Get water with all the other women. And they could look down at her all they wanted to. They could think about her however they wanted to think about her. 
but to heaven with all them. You hear me? To heaven with them all. It didn't matter what they thought about her. She knew what God thought about her. She knew what God said about her. Oh, my God. Why do you get up here and act the way you do, Caleb? Why do you get up here and praise God like you do? You know you're too heavy to be moving like that. Because when I think about what God has done for me, I can't stay solid. I can't stay quiet. When I think about what he's brought me out of and what he says about me, I can walk. I can get up. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what they say about you. It doesn't matter what they think about you. What does God say about you? I'm drunk of this water. And it has changed my life. I don't need this story. I've lived this story. You don't need this story. You are this story. You have drunk of the water. And your life's never been the same. Well, Jesus said, I'll give you a water. You'll never thirst again. And everyone who drinks from this water will be changed. For it'll be a water springing up for eternal life. <laughs> and now she didn't quite understand. She wanted some water to keep her from having to go out and deal with all the issues and deal with what the people were saying about her. But Jesus continues. And the next thing he says to her was not him calling her out. A lot of people think, well, Jesus just called her out, and read her mail, that's not what's going on here. Jesus began to talk about something that she couldn't talk about herself because she was too ate up with guilt and condemnation. And Jesus said, I know you can't come out and say it, baby. I'll say it for you. I know why you don't want to, I know why you don't want to come out here in the morning time or the evening. I know why you I, I know why you're here today. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with is not your husband. And she said, well, I see you must be a prophet. She's getting a little closer now. She said, you must be a prophet. And then she gets religious. <laughs> now this is so good. I've never heard a preacher preach what I'm about to say. Which either makes me really smart or wrong. One of the two. I'm joking. I'm right. This is right. He, he, he speaks to her issue and then she gets real religious and says, well, I've been trying to find a place to go to church, but I don't. That's what she said. The first thing she said, he said, you live, he said, you've had five husbands, and the man you're living with is not even your husband. And she said, well, dog, I, I, you know, I've been trying to go to church, but once, yeah, what had happened was, was once they go worship him here, once they go worship, I don't know what to do. I, I'm glad you came today because you're right, and I will find out once and for all what to do and where to go to church and where to worship. And Jesus told her, believe me, woman, the hour is coming. What hour was he talking about? He was talking about the, the hour of the cross. The resurrection. He said, there's coming an hour. You won't have to worry about worshiping me over there or worshiping God over there. There's coming an hour that when the true worshipers worship me, 
They'll have to worship me in spirit and in truth. Verse 23. But an hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship Him. For God is a spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Here's a beautiful thing. Now don't miss it. There's no way you can worship God without Jesus. Let me say it again. There's no way you can worship God without Jesus. It doesn't matter how good you've been this week. If you try to offer up worship and praise to, to, to God in your own work, in your goodness, and your righteousness, it's a worship that he will not accept. So worship he will not accept. The only worship he accepts is from those who have been washed under his blood. Because see, it's either about what you've done or it's about what he has done. And God is perfect and he demands perfection. And you can't give him that. So how does... God, hear our prayers if you believe in Jesus. There's coming a day when you can worship him in your car, in the shower, outside, in this church, at work, and I will hear you because when you open your mouth, I don't see you and all your flaws and all your imperfections. When God hears your worship, he hears the worship of Jesus. When he sees you, he sees perfection because he sees Jesus Christ. Verse 25 says, the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. I hear what you're saying. What's your name again? She didn't even know his name. I know that Messiah is coming, who's called Christ. And when he comes, he'll explain everything. To, I've heard what you've had to say. There's coming one who even tell you and me what's going on. Next verse. And Jesus told her, I am. I am that one. Quit searching, woman. Quit looking. Quit trying to find it. I'm the one you've been looking for. I'm the one you've been waiting for. I'm the one who wants to heal you of your sin. I'm the one who wants to lift the weight of sin and the heaviness and the brokenness and the condemnation and the shame. I'm the one. I am he who you're speaking about. You're talking to it. Verse 27, then his disciples arrived and they were amazed that he was talking to this woman. Yet no one said, what do you want or why are you talking with her? Then the woman, I love this, left her bucket. Just left it. See, there's a great exchange happen, that happens. Mm -hmm. When you take Jesus there's some things that you can leave, that you can drop, that you don't need to carry anymore. And she dropped her bucket. She left her bucket. And she went into town bucketless, but with, a re with peace that she never had. Oh, hallelujah. This is getting too much, 
too hot to handle here. You hear me? She left her bucket and she said, come see a man. Oh, hallelujah. If I, that's my message. That's the title. Come see a man. She said, come see a man who told me everything that I'd ever done. But he didn't condemn me. He didn't look down on me. He didn't say, sorry, got the wrong one. No, he knew everything I had ever done. And he loved me in spite of it all. In spite of it all. I want to ask you this morning, musicians and singers, you can come. I want to ask you this morning, have you experienced the water from this well? Stand with me all across the building. Have you? Or do you have religion? See, she tried to throw up religion every time. She tried to throw up religion, but religion don't work. Hear me now. Religion don't work. Religion does not. There's 200 something churches in Ware County. I've done the math. If everybody went to church in Ware County, every church would have 178 people. But unfortunately, a majority of churches around the world, world are wells without water. Let's say they wasn't good churches and it said they didn't have good programs but you can take all the programs you can take all the you can take all the programs and they won't do you any good I've never seen a program deliver an alcoholic I've never seen a program deliver a drug addict I've never seen good church save a sinner. I've never seen good preaching save a sinner. But I have seen Jesus. Won't he do it? Huh? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? I, I, I have seen, I have seen God do amazing talking about this water. This water that if you drink of it, you'll never thirst again. I don't need this story to tell me it's the truth. I've experienced it with my own life. I've seen it with my own eyes. This is what God does. He looks for the person trying to get water at noon. He looks for the person Who's trying to just make it? Friend, you can only make it so far without Jesus. But today, Jesus had to come by, not Samaria today, but 3205 Memorial Drive. He had to come by today. <laughs> Uh, he was compelled by love to come to 3205 out of all the places in the world today he came here oh yeah he's every, he's, he's in other places too but he's here today to meet you at the well running from God he's here 
never taken a drink of this water. He's here trying to seclude and hide and bury all your feelings and the pain and the agony. He's here trying to do this life on your own. He's here. He wants to save you today.